Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Today is day number 78, the first day of our 12th week together. That means it's time for our weekly check-in. How are things going? Uh, It seems like some of you might be getting a little bit behind in your reading, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. You're reading the Bible more than you would have before. I'm proud of you. You're doing a great job. Keep in there and keep learning more about the Bible, learning more about God, and growing deeper in your relationship with Him. We're in this together. Let's keep going towards the goal. Today, we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 24, 25, 26, and 27, four chapters today, so we better go ahead and get started reading. But before we do that, let's pray and ask that God would continue to grow us more and more into the image of his Son as we behold him in his word. Today's prayer is from the book Piercing Heaven, Prayers of the Puritans by Robert Elmer. This prayer is entitled, Waiting for the King of Glory. It's by the Puritan Philip Doddridge. Blessed Lord, my soul rises to you in a flame. You have said you are coming quickly, and I reply, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, I long to be done with the burdens and sorrows of this life. Come, I long to ascend to your presence and see you in your courts above. Death transformed when I see it in this light. I no longer fear the king of terrors when the king of glory and grace is so near. I hear with pleasure the sound of your feet approaching nearer and nearer. Draw aside the veil whenever you please. Open the bars of my prison so my eager soul may spring forth to you and I may throw myself at your feet, at the feet of Jesus. Though I have not yet seen him, I love him and I am filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Lord, you will show me the path of life and you will guide me to the place where there is fullness of joy. You will give me a place with your faithful servants whose spirits live with you now while their bodies sleep in the dust. Many have been my dear companions in your work, partners in the tribulation and the kingdom, brothers and sisters in Christ. Blessed Savior, show me how glorious and happy you have made them. Show me that better life you have given to those we call the dead. Show me how much more noble and busy they are with you, so I can praise you even more for your goodness to them. I want to share with them in their blessings and service to you, raising a song of grateful love, just like the one they sing in your presence. Blessed Redeemer, I look forward to that nobler and more glorious hope, and when I am there, I will look forward even more to the day of your final appearance. There, I will long even more to see you vindicated, your triumph displayed, and the dust of your servants brought back to life. There, I will see the final enemy, death itself, swallowed up in victory. I will long for that greater honor you have reserved for me and the complete happiness waiting for all your people. All the millions of your saints, saved by your grace, will say, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Their words will mingle with the songs of paradise. In the meantime, Master, accept the worship and praise my grateful heart offers you now. You have inspired me with glorious hope. You have given me joy and raised my soul to this place. Otherwise, I might have been groveling in the lowest trifles of the here and now, looking with horror to the hour that now excites me so. Be with me always, even to the end of this mortal life. And while I await your salvation, help me follow your ways. Strengthen me and keep my light shining for you. Keep my ears tuned to the wonderful signal of your arrival, so my glowing soul springs to meet you with pleasure. Strengthen and prepare me in death for those visions of glory which this feeble body could never endure. Amen.
All right, we've got four chapters to read. We better get down to it. This is Deuteronomy chapter 24 to 27. Hope you've got your Bible out. I've got mine. Let's start reading. Chapter 24. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after she has been defiled for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be liable for any other public duty. He shall be free at home one year to be happy with his wife whom he has taken. No one shall take a mill or an upper millstone in pledge, for that would be taking a life in pledge. If a man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel, or if he treats him as a slave or sells him, then that thief shall die. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Take care in a case of leprous disease to be very careful to do according to all that the Levitical priest shall direct you. As I commanded them, so you shall be careful to do. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way as you came out of Egypt. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not go into his house to collect his pledge. You shall stand outside, and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. And if he is a poor man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall restore to him the pledge as the sun sets, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you. And it shall be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin." You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless, or take a widow's garment in pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. Chapter 25 If there is a dispute between men... And they come into the court, and the judge decides between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. Then if the guilty man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with a number of stripes in proportion to his offense. Forty stripes may be given him, but not more, lest, if one should go on to beat him with more stripes than these, your brother be degraded in your sight. You shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain." If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, Then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot 
and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. When men fight with one another, and the wife of the one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of him who is beating him, and puts out her hand and seizes him by the private parts, then you shall cut off her hand. Your eye shall have no pity. You shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights, a large and a small. You shall not have in your house two kinds of measures, a large and a small. A full and fair weight you shall have, a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are an abomination to the Lord your God. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Chapter 26 When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, You shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, And the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God, and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. When you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, giving it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your towns and be filled, then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion out of my house, and moreover, I have given it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all your commandment that you have commanded me. I have not transgressed any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten of the tithe while I was mourning, or removed any of it while I was unclean, or offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation, from heaven, and bless your people Israel and the ground that you have given us, as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. This day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and rules. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared today that the Lord is your God, and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his rules and will obey his voice. And the Lord has declared today that you are a people for his treasured possession, as he has promised you, and that you are to keep all his commandments, and that he will set you in praise and in fame and in honor high above all nations that he has made, and that you shall be a people holy to the Lord your God, as he promised. Chapter 27 Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. And you shall write on them all the words of this law 
when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones, concerning which I command you today, on Mount Ebal. And you shall plaster them with plaster, and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings, and shall eat there. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, and you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. Then Moses and the Levitical priests said to all Israel, Keep silence, and hear, O Israel, this day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. That day Moses charged the people, saying, When you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's nakedness. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. You know, this isn't the first podcast I've ever made. Uh, I've done several others with friends in the past, going all the way back to pretty much the beginning of podcasting. And normally it's a very arduous and and time-consuming process of recording and editing and mixing and finding music that you can use on the podcast and sound clips and things like that to try to put it all together to make a nice finished product. But Anchor.fm makes that all so much easier. Uh, I use Anchor. It is free. And the creation tools that they allow me to use to record and edit the podcast right from my phone or right on my uh, computer, right through my web browser, just make it absolutely effortless. This is an amazing product that they offer uh, absolutely free. And so if you're looking to start a podcast, looking to get anything going, um, if you've got a great idea, I encourage you get out there and do it with Anchor.fm. Uh, the, my favorite part about the entire process with Anchor is that they uh, will actually distribute the podcast for me. So whenever I'm done, whenever I'm all finished recording, I just hit done and I tell them when I want it to be published 
and it magically goes out to places like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and everywhere else that you guys listen to. Uh, so it's magical. And you can even make money from your podcast when you get uh, listeners, folks start listening to your podcast, as many people as are listening to the ads that you record, like this one, uh, you end up getting paid for those things. And so it's everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, which I would encourage anybody to do, you've got a voice, we want your voice to be heard, go and download the free Anchor app now. Or go to anchor.fm to get started. Man, can I just say that there is too much in these four chapters uh, to go over right now in this short amount of time? And you go back and read them again. Man, there's so much that is here that we could talk about. First off, in the beginning of chapter 24, we see this provision that restricts a man from remarrying a woman after he's already divorced her. And even Jesus goes into this and uh, refers to it, and he says that it's not lawful for a man to put away his wife except for cases of sexual immorality, and if he does so, and someone comes along and marries her, he's causing her to commit adultery and the person that marries her to commit adultery. Uh, and so really, it's that's the definition of this defiling her that is listed here in Deuteronomy 24. Some people get confused on that, but this is saying marriage is really, really important, and this is the only place in all of the Old Testament that we get any kind of information about what divorce looks like. And so this gets used as a you know, kind of a proof text for what is meant for divorce. And some of the teachers of the law brought this to Jesus as a question saying, hey, should people just, you know, divorce their wife for whatever reason? She burnt my toast this morning. I'm going to get a divorce. And he said, no, what God has brought together, let man not separate. Marriage is very serious. Next, he brings up a ton of miscellaneous laws, my favorite of which was the draft exemption for the first year of the marriage. Uh, I think this was Moses' fun way of saying, hey, uh, you don't need to go to war for your first year of marriage because your first year of marriage is already war enough. You're going to be figuring each other out, and you need to be there to uh, keep your wife happy and do this. And so no war for you during the first year of your marriage. Second, this idea of not taking someone's millstone here. This is like taking someone's dentures. Okay, you, you can't take the bottom denture from someone because they need it to chew. Well, a millstone, this is how you ground up your grain and made your flour. And if you took away the top or the lower millstone, you couldn't use your mill. And so you could no longer make flour to be able to feed yourself. And so it says, you don't take this from somebody uh, as collateral for a loan. That's just silly. That would be to take their life. Next, they ended this plague of slavery. Well, we say that slavery's ended, but even today, you know, slavery isn't ended. There are still 20 to 30 million slaves in our world today, and many of those are in sex slavery, sex trafficking around the globe. And gladly, there are law enforcement agencies and people that try to stop this, but here, God makes it very clear that amongst the Hebrews, amongst his people, that should not be a thing, that we don't, you don't take people and sell them. He continues to go on with these miscellaneous laws saying that, you know, poor people, uh, if you do take collateral from them for a loan, you give their cloak or whatever it is that they gave back to you that night so that they aren't, you know, freezing or starving. Um, and, Payment should come every day. Having worked in human resources before, I get a little convicted by this one because I made sure that people got paid every week, um, but they weren't paid every day like this says. And uh, I definitely saw people that could have used that daily paycheck because they were hurting for money. Uh, and so it makes me a little sad that we didn't pay people daily because of this, because I think it would definitely help people. And 
you can see God's heart here for the poor, for the fatherless, for the widow, for the sojourner, that they are all to be treated well. They're not supposed to be uh, exploited, but protected. Uh, and the foreigners and the poor people are able to glean in the field, uh, that you don't take every little bit from the field, but rather leave some for those who can't make it for themselves. You see a limit on lashings or beatings here in Deuteronomy chapter 25 uh, that the rabbis even changed during their time to say 39 instead of 40 because they wanted to make sure that if somebody miscounted, they weren't going to break this law. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11.24 that he was beaten with the lashes by the Jews five times with this conviction of getting 40 stripes minus one, or 39 lashes. Um, This was a prescribed beating that the judge, the council, the Sanhedrin would say, yes, you need to have a beating. Uh, And this would have been a punishment less than death, but also very serious. Next, in chapter 25, we see this reference to not muzzling an ox that treads out the grain. Uh, And this is great because we get this verse quoted by Paul twice. First, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9, where it speaks of taking care of people as they are working, same context is there in 1 Timothy 5.18, essentially saying that you know preachers ought to get paid. We are the workers. We're the ones that are uh, the ox treading out the corn. And it says, don't muzzle us. You know, so at least let us eat our fill while we are walking and treading out this grain on the circular mill that's here. And then in chapter 25, uh, the middle of the chapter here, we get into the law of the kinsman redeemer uh, or the goel and how it is all meant to work. It was your obligation after your brother's untimely death to take his wife as your wife and to give her an opportunity to bear a child. But what if you didn't want to do that? What if you refused to do that? Well, it gets pretty serious. It goes before the council. Uh, and then if still, even though he's been brought before the, the council to be questioned, if he still refuses, she's to pull off his sandal and spit in his face and essentially curse him. And this was all intended to keep the land in the family and in the household that it belonged in. The same reason why you don't move the property markers uh, and change those around. Nope, these stay the same. They stay fixed. This wasn't This land wasn't something that they were going to barter with and change and move. This was their inheritance from God forever. As we end Deuteronomy chapter 25, we get another reminder about the Amalekites and not forgetting about what the Amalekites have done and making sure that they are completely routed. This commitment to eradicating the Amalekites is something that is going to be uh, a a difficulty for the Israelites for their entire time. Uh, There's a celebration that happens during uh, the Feast of Purim, which we see uh, the origins of it in the book of Esther, and we'll get there uh, soon as we continue reading this year. But in the book of Esther, we see this feast or celebration of Purim, And we see that it's all about the death of this guy, Haman, and and the overcoming his plot to kill the Jews. Well, Haman, according to Jewish tradition, was an Amalekite. Uh, And so, so even in this late time, after the exile of the people to Babylon, now they've returned home and they are still being plagued by these Amalekites. In chapter 26, we get this kind of neat picture of what happens every third year when the tithe was taken up, uh, that they would bring this tithe and then they would kind of sing this ritual saying that was offered as a commitment to God and expressing thankfulness for his provisions. This was uh, the mandatory tithe, which was how the government provided for the needs of uh, the government servants and the poor. Uh, All of the temple activities were taken up because of this. And then in chapter 27, we get the information on this 
awesome site where half of the Jews go onto Mount Ebal and half go onto Mount Gerizim, and they are speaking back and forth to one another, doing this kind of call and response to one another. Imagine a million people on one mountain and a million people on another mountain uh, with the city of Shechem in the middle, and they are shouting these things back and forth, being led by the Levites in this call and response, these curses that are given to Mount Ebal. We're not actually going to see this happen until Joshua chapter 8, but uh, it's an earth-shaking kind of experience when we do see it. So I think it's important as we read through this to recognize as the people cross over the Jordan, which they haven't done yet, they're getting ready to though, they're told by God to cross over and then immediately establish a pillar, build up this pillar, build up this uh, monument to God's faithfulness and make sacrifices and praise God there as they go. Every step of the way as they move through the wilderness, as they you know, conquer enemies, as they a- achieve these steps that God is setting forth, he says, don't forget that you didn't do it on your own. Don't forget that you've come this far by my help, and you're not going to get any further without my help. And so continue to seek the face of God, continue to give him thanks for everything that is happening in your life. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash dbrpodcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow, keep reading and keep worshiping.